Hi, welcome to Let's Talk About Wine. If you love old world wine, chances are good that Italian wines are among your favorites. As one of the world's largest producers of wine, Italy has a long history of making some of the best and most popular wines on the planet. Barolo, Barbaresco, Chianti, Brunello, Prosecco are among the most widely recognized names in the wine world today. Although a handful of varieties such as Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, and Trebbiano get the majority of the publicity, there are actually more than 350 different varieties of grapes that are used in making Italian wines. So with me today are my friends and fellow wine lovers, Angela and Baron, who are here to tell us a little bit more about a couple of Italian grape varieties that are a little less well known, but make terrific world-class wines. So welcome. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. So we have a, a red and a white. Um, why don't we start traditional? Let's start with the white. Baron, would you like to tell us a little bit more about that wine? Sure. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, our first wine is from the second largest island in the Mediterranean, Sardinia. Uh, this example is a 2016. It's a white wine. It's a 2016 it's Elagas. It's a DOC wine. And it's made by the Argiolis family winery in, on Sardinia from the Naragas grape, which is grown only on Sardinia and nowhere else. And because it's only grown on Sardinia, there is, has been some debate about how the grape actually got there. Some people believe that the grape is actually indigenous to the island. Others believe that it was brought to the island during one of the two uh, um, attempted campaigns and ultimately successful campaigns by the Phoenicians to conquer the island. Uh, the grape is widely planted throughout the island, uh, but still a small uh, limited planting of about 21,000 acres, and it's uh, mostly planted in the Campidano Plain, uh, in the warmer climates of the Campidano Plain in the southern part of the island. Um, now, Italian law says that the grape, uh, the wine, actually needs to be at least 85% uh, Naragas grape in order to be labeled Naragas di Cagliari, which is the town of, about which the winery is centered. And the other 15% of the wine can be made up of local um, white wine varieties. So the grape is not well known outside of Sardinia um, because most of it is actually consumed locally. So not a lot gets out. There's not a big export um, market uh, for this type of wine. Um, so we were though at actually able to find an example here in Rochester at a local wine shop and we were able to pick up a, a great example of this wine uh, locally. Now, um, also on the wine bottle, there is an interesting label feature, and it, it represents the approximately 7,000 stone structures that are scattered throughout the island called Naraga. They were put there by the ancient Naragic people. Uh, however, the the function of these structures is not well known, and it's still unknown to this day. Hmm. That's a fascinating story, and I always love a great story about a great wine. But the best part is tasting it, so let's go ahead and give it a try. So traditionally, you're going to pick up notes of pear, uh, honey, um, also some herbaceousness. It's not overpoweringly herbaceous, but it does sometimes remind you of a Sauvignon Blanc. Very aromatic. Mm -hmm. It's very. There's a nice bright acidity to the wine, a little bit of buttery smoothness there. And you can pick up a, a lot of the... Now, one of the things that you're going to get on the palate more than you're going to get on the nose is that citrusy, lemony mm -hmm. flavor that doesn't quite come through uh, the herbaceousness of the, of the, pa of the nose kind of uh, suppresses that citrus um, aroma. Um, and, and, but you will get you know, the buttery smoothness there. Um, and there is a little bit of a bitterness on the fairly short finish of mm -hmm. this wine. Now, uh, if you want to pair this wine, 
Typically, because Sardinia is a an island surrounded by seawater, uh, uh, seafood is a natural choice, and it does pair very well with seafood. However, you can also pair it with creamy cheeses or d'oeuvres, but stick mostly to lighter fare, lighter dishes. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. It's got a great combination of flavors, but that great acidity also makes it a terrific food-friendly uh, wine. Great, mm -hmm. outstanding, great choice. Thank you. Okay, so that was a terrific example of a really good Italian white wine. But as everybody knows, Italy's most well-known for its reds. So, Angela, you brought a red with you today. Can you tell us a little bit more about that wine? I'd love to. Thanks, Lindsay. So today I brought a 2010 Colpertone Montefalco Sagrantino. Montefalco meaning Mount of the Falcon, Sagrantino meaning sacred. So this is very much a sacred grape to the people of Italy. Grown in the region of Umbria, you've got the moderating temperatures of the Mediterranean, the cool breezes of the Apennine Mountains, warm days, cool nights, couldn't be a more beautiful region to be in, as well as grow a grape. Happy grapes. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So this wine is made from 100% Sagrantino grape, very thick, dark-skinned purple grape. To make this wine, it goes through about three weeks of fermentation in stainless steel, then it ages for a year in new French oak, and then another several years in the bottle. So it takes a while before we can actually consume this <laughs> wine. This is a wine that has a lot of ageability, but it's got some very mysterious origins, so I'd love to tell you a little bit about Let's that. Let's hear it. I'd love All to. Right. So some people believe that the Greeks brought the wine to, to Italy. Some believe that French friars did. Others believe it's indigenous to the region. But some of the locals that I spoke to, including a historian from Assisi, tell a different story. So I'd like to share that with everyone today. They believe that it was brought to the region by St. Francis of Assisi during his travels uh, abroad to Asia Minor. So when he returned from those travels, he had this very mysterious grapevine that no one in the region mm -hmm. had seen before. Planted it and began to make wine, he and his followers. So as that became more and more popular, everyone wanted some of this wine, it began to be stolen in the middle of the night. Grapevines were being dug up. Unfortunately, those individuals that took it could not grow this vine very hmm. successfully. So it quickly turned into a wine that most believed had to be grown by Francis or his followers, followers because it was touched by the hand of God. So priests of the day began to use that for their sacramental wine during masses. Beautiful paintings, frescoes were being painted featuring the Sagrantino grape. So very, very important to the Italian culture. Now today, this grape is grown outside of Italy, a bit in Australia, a bit in California, but the locals in Italy that I speak to won't even think about touching the grape from, from those regions. They believe it, this grape needs to live and breathe in Italy and really only support the grapes that are, that are grown in the Montefalco region. So as far as growing in that region, only 50 producers hmm. covering about 3,000, yes, 3,000 wow. plants. really acres. limited production. Very, very limited to production. So most of the wine is kept in country, very similar mm -hmm. to the white that we had mm -hmm. today. However, there is some export. So we were able to find one producer locally, and anywhere that I go in my travels in the United States, I'm always looking for this <laughs> wine, and once in a while I can find one or two producers. So if you're ever in Italy, be sure to pick up a case or two <laughs> And spend that money to ship it home because it's very rare to uh, to be able to pick it up here in the U.S. Yeah. I've yet to find a Montefalco Sagrantino on a restaurant menu in the United States. However, I have seen a Montefalco Rosso. Hmm. Don't want anyone who's able to find that to confuse it with 100% Sagrantino. That is about 80% Sangiovese with 10 to 20% Sagrantino. If you can find it, definitely recommend ordering it. But what we have here is the real deal, 100% Sagrantino from Montefalco. Wow, what a treat. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Beautiful representation of a Montefalco Sagrantino. You're going to get aromas of very deep, dark cherry, a little bit of dried fruit, even some fig. Definitely an old world wine. So immediately you're going to pick up the tannins in this wine for sure. You should be able to pick up a little bit of chocolate, mm -hmm. a touch of tar, definitely those deep fig, plum, and deep cherry mm -hmm. 
flavors. Yeah. What do you think? Dark fruits. I like it. Yeah, it's I very like good. It. So, so even though this is a young wine, it still has a lot of life ahead of it. Absolutely, it does. So, as I said, about four to five years, I really wouldn't want to uh, give open this bottle prior to that. But seven, eight, nine years, I think, is really the optimal time to open this as a young wine. Uh, put this in your cellar. Try to not think about it for a decade. <laughs> pull it out, and it will be a beautiful, beautiful wine. Those tannins will be tamed a little bit and perfect to pair with a, a marbled steak, truffled, drizzled mushrooms, or roasted vegetables. Wow, so great flavor, even better ageability, and a terrific story to go with it. How do you beat that? Absolutely can. <laughs> Well, Angela and Baron, thank you so much for joining us today. We really enjoyed those stories that you told us about, those two lesser-known Italian grapes. Any final thoughts on the wines that you introduced us to? Uh, the 2016 Salagas DOC, uh, fairly hard to find around here. We did find an example of it in Rochester. If you find it, pick it up. You won't be, uh, you won't be disappointed. Um, you'll enjoy a butteriness, a uh, slight bitterness on a fairly short finish, but uh, it's very aromatic and well paired with seafood, lighter fare such as hors d'oeuvres, creamy cheeses, and uh, serve it a little bit warmer than you would normally serve a white wine. Uh, it benefits uh, from a little bit like a cellar temperature mm -hmm. type of uh, temperature and uh, it will bring out the herbaceousness and the, uh, the lemon, honey, and, and uh, lemon, uh, I'm sorry, the lemon citrus flavors. Great. It was terrific wine. Thank you so much for introducing us to that. Angela, anything from you? Uh, yes. Today we had a 2010 Montefalco Sagrantino. Maybe a little bit tough to find, but do your best to hunt that down. Purchase a few bottles. Have one bottle with dinner tonight. Of course, be sure to have a nice marbled steak and roasted vegetables with it. But take that second bottle, put it in your cellar, forget about it for about <laughs> 10 years, pull it out and enjoy a very beautiful, different, tannic, tamed wine. Great. Good advice. Thank you so much. And again, thank you both so much. And thank you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this look at two of Italy's lesser known grapes. And we hope you'll join us in future for, uh, for additional episodes of Let's Talk About Wine. And in the meantime, cheers. Cheers. cheers.